everyone, and a big welcome back to episode four, who would have thought it, the Forge Ahead Show podcast and video series. Um, this is where we get on to a storytellers, the people that have gone from an adversity to something really exciting with that. And before we start, I'm really conscious of something. I do have other caps and other shirts. I just seem to be wearing the same one as a banner today. But there we go. That was in my head. So the Forger Head Show. And we are sponsored by the awesome people at Dougie Stone Radio. They are freaking global. And my good mate, Mark Brimson, hosts a series of amazing shows. So please do check them out. Links in the bio. And today, I'm bringing you a man. Not a man, but the man. The Hef. Dave Heffernan. Hello, Dev. Hello, Hef. Dev. <laughs> How are we doing? We okay, Nick? I'm good. I told you I'm not editing, even when I mess up. <laughs> Def, yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit weird, isn't it? Kind of bit, yeah, a bit Sheffield drummer, like Def Leppard kind of thing going on. <laughs> so you are called the Hef. Uh, explain. It's simple to me because I know your surname. But who are you, Dave? Well, I'm Dave, and I'm a coach, speaker, and um, trainer, specialised in anxiety, stress, and workplace well-being. Um, I've been called the Hef ever since school days, really. And because your young... surname is Heffernan. Yes. Just so people don't think I'm completely like lost the plot, just call everybody the Hef now for some reason. I do get called the Hoff as well, but I'm not Grace Torso, so I can't really get me red shorts on. No, I, I, mate. As I much as I love you, call. I'm pleased about that. It'd be a really weird podcast with just you and your red shorts on. To be fair, <laughs> so. Thank you so much for joining me. So I know Dave, we met through uh, a personal development group we're both members of, the Now What Club, through uh, Four Networking, uh, absolutely top bloke. Um, he's also been my stunt double for a gig I couldn't get to, so he's, he's gone and delivered an amazing talk. Uh, client was really, really happy, spoke amazingly about him. So again, Dave speaks uh, from the lived experience of mental health, but also with extra twists and turns, I'm sure that'll come out throughout this Kind of interview. Interview sounds very formal. This chat amongst mates. So, the Hef, give us a little bit about your background, mate. Um, quite unique. Uh, not normal in the um, normal sense of the word. Um, I grew up in a place called Salford, uh, which is Great Manchester, and I grew up in a really rough part of the UK. It was actually labelled one of the roughest council estates in the whole of Europe. Hodsall. Um, I've had a bit of a crazy life and I'll just do a very quick bio. Um, at five years old I served on the altar um, and I served my very first funeral at five years old. Between the age of five and eight I served over 400 funerals so at a very young age became very used to grief and death. Right. Eight years old I became an unofficial grief counsellor. Adults would sit next to me and pour the heart out and all I kept on hearing was regret. Um, 14 years old I started getting a conscience and realising around me there was no real male role models. And so I set about wanting to develop a childcare club and um, centre in Odsall. Two years later, I told my dad, this is exactly what I'm going to do. And he threw me out onto the street. And for two years, I lived rough, above drug dealers, squats in cemeteries, park benches. But I managed to get the childcare centre up and running and get my A-levels during that time. I've been arrested for arson. I've had several death threats against myself. Uh, more recently, I've been diagnosed with motor neuron disease, severe spinal canal stenosis, leading to paralysis and um, paralyzed diaphragm and 30% by lung capacity. All met with the strategies that I teach people, learning to control the controllables, looking for the positives, and the learning curve, which is in every experience that we go through. And that's been a nutshell, really. It's huge. I mean, <laughs> you say it's a nutshell. It's a big, huge nutshell, to be <laughs> fair. Um, so you touched on a few things I really want to pick up on then. So I think most importantly, start from the back to the front. Um, you said you, you've recently been diagnosed. Actually, how... I know you've used your own mechanisms to kind of cope with that, but to most other people, that would um, that would really knock their socks off. I mean, it'd be hard to come back from that. How do you kind of manage that? Share some of your best kind of tools and tips on managing that. Yes, yeah, certainly. Well, all we can do is control the controllables. Um, Love that. I could look... What I can control with this, I can look at my diet, I can work out the best things to eat and, eat and fuel my body. Um, I can, you know do as much exercise as I can do. I can listen to my body and rest where needed to rest and you know push it where it can be pushed. That's all I can do. There's no point or certain purpose served in me working out the stuff that's outside of my control. Yeah. You know, and so I don't put any energy towards that sort of stuff. And as I mentioned in the first few minutes there, is I look at the positive in the learning curve. I guarantee no matter what situation we go through or what experience we get given, 
there is a positive in the learning curve and it's ingrained in me now to look at what positives are in there and what um, learning curves, you know, recently I talked about the spinal canal stenosis, which the, you know, consultant said that will lead to paralysis. With the motor neuron, they said that I would be bedridden and wheelchair bound. That's not happened. I've come off all my tablets. You know, I educated myself with the tablets and half of them, and this is not medical advice by the way, but this is my personal journey. Um, I looked at what tablets were doing to me and half of them counteract on the other half. Because I was under five different consultants, they were all medicating for their own particular field. You know, mm. I was incontinent, I was, um, I had lung issues, I was under the lung consultant, I was under the neurologist, the urologist, the audiologist, and there was another consultant who had no idea what he was there for. I think he was just feeling left out because he'd gone through the whole of the NHS and he just wanted to be part of the, uh, the meetings. And, but they was doing their own particular field of medication. And what I realized very quickly is half of them were counteracting the bar, but having side effects. And I'm quite black and white. I can take the emotion out of facts now in situations to look at the facts. And so I said to my wife, I said, I'm coming off all my tablets because I would rather be in pain and drug free than be in pain and still have a lot of drugs in my system and having for side effects. It seemed wow. obvious to me. And so literally that day I came off every single one of them. Yeah. And I'm now living a quality of life. Even the neurologist calls me the freak. <laughs> which is nice. Um, Garmin. <laughs> she available for kids parties. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's a lovely guy. He could tell me I'm dying tomorrow. And I say, oh, he's sorry. Yeah, he's he's a, <laughs> um, but the spinal consultant I spoke to nine months ago and I'd had the MRI and they said, yeah, you've got this spinal canal stenosis. It's quite severe. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I said, look, give me straight. Give me the prognosis. Give me what's going on straight. I said, I've got strategies I can cope. And his words to me were, if you was to go down the surgical route, which is the only route available to yourself, then you may as well book into Dignity Task because at least you'd have a nice holiday to Switzerland beforehand. Wow. Wow. So I said to him, can you give me the fluffy version? <laughs> <that was> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, that was but, too brutal. Yeah, you know, but, but you, what a brilliant you, way to explain <laughs> to somebody that if you went onto the operating geez. table, you would be dead. Yeah. That's yeah. nuts. I mean, you touched on something really important now, which was um, not controlling the uncontrollables. Like my dog was barking right now. Yeah. Again, I refuse to edit any of this. So apologies for the chuffing in the background, but there we go. So uh, the controlling the uncontrollable, um, I do a version of that, managing the manageables. And yeah. uh, it both achieves the same thing, that the pursuit of trying to manage the, the unmanageable stuff or controlling the uncontrollable creates anxiety. It's a real human flaw, isn't it? And I think there's a real challenge in that. Uh, there really is. Um, so obviously that's how it affects you, but in terms of how it affects other people, because actually, because you have got your own coping mechanisms, um, how do you then help other people, like your, the closest, your nearest and dearest, with their coming to terms with that kind of situation? The question, because I remember speaking to a business coach many years back, and he was saying, you know, you've got it all sorted, Dave, that's fine. So, but what you don't understand is you've not mentioned your wife once really and she'll be looking 10 years in the future she'll be looking at hoists and wet rooms and various other things and that really sort of slapped me across the face because i was thinking about myself far too much mm. um and the good thing is is i try and keep it simple for them i say to my wife i said you know if you see me panicking that's when we really know the shit's hitting the fan so mm. use me as a barometer you know what i mean and the wife loves to stress, you know what I mean? It's ingrained in her to stress. And some people, you know, the timing has to be right. We can't force anybody to change. You know, they've got to have their own reckoning. They've got to have their own moment where the mind opens. And you know what, actually, this makes sense. So what I try and do for people is keep it really simple. Yeah. And what I always say to somebody, I said, look, if you can, sit in silence for 20 minutes. I said, well, we can't do that. So what's your ego talking straight away? You know what I mean? Because you've not tried sitting in silence for a minute. Well, I have, and it, I just didn't feel comfortable. I said, well, yeah. just accept what your thoughts are coming through. Accept that this is ego, and yeah. ego loves resistance. So the more you resist these mm. thoughts, the more Love ego that. will get louder and louder and louder. And that's when people get into these serious anxiety attacks and panic attacks and depression. Yeah. So just allow them to be there, like a little bubble, just let them float. Allow them to be there. And I guarantee, once you're generally okay with them being there, they'll disappear because they hate yeah. the mission. Absolutely. And then you'll start tuning into the intuition then. And Absolutely. I get them to do that first. And once you get that little bit of a result, I actually did it. Yeah. And yeah, I, I felt different. Then we can move forward then. Just that simple exercise. 
I'd yeah. like to do first. Fantastic. But nobody's ever bored. Nobody's ever bored anymore. When they get bored, <laughs> they put on Netflix or Facebook or whatever it may be. Yeah. I try and promote people getting really bored so they can just sit in silence. <laughs> keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep, uh, uh, keeping it simple is good for me, mate. Trust me. So you, you also touched on something, again, really important. And I guess given the space that we work in as well, um, I get this a lot, that uh, the positive male role model, um, that uh, I do a lot of work with like colleges and with other people that don't necessarily have that and haven't had that before. Um, and I think especially men in mental health and sharing things that are personal, like lived experience, actually it seems to be quite rare, if I'm honest, um, I mean, I've literally been books to speak because, oh, you're that guy with the beard and the cap. Oh, by the way, you're a man. Not, yeah. not because I'm a good speaker or anything else, just because of that thing. They want to hear a man talk about that stuff. So do you find that um, that's kind of common with, with kind of your experiences with clients or people that you know as well? Is it because as a, as a, a positive male role model that will actually open doors for you? Yes, yeah, certainly. I, I think the issue is, is about conditioning. And for years and years and years, we've been conditioned as men to be the hunters and gatherers, you know, get bringing the money in, you know, we don't show our emotions, chin up, get on with it, go down to the pub and have a pint, and that'll sort itself out. And every movie that you see, when everybody's got some sort of issue, they go to the pub and they get the whiskey or they get the bourbon or whatever. And that seems to be the default. And so mm. our subconscious, our, you know, our conditioning is being um, rammed into our minds that this is what we need to do. I used to um, be involved heavily with a pre and postnatal depression charity, and I was involved and I was in charge of the men's section. Yeah. And we had literally thousands of men on there, and just me as the admin. And the main pre and postnatal depression group for the women had 25 admin and thousands of members. And the Facebook always says, you know, response to messages in X amount of hours or whatever. With the main group, it was response to messages within two and a half hours, three hours. And with me, it was response messages within four minutes. And I was constantly getting messages in. And I, I likened it to the pub. I said, look, I said, we're all mates here. You know what I mean? We're all open. Just if you want to say anything, say it. If you don't, you don't. You won't be judged. Yeah. And one thing I found is men do want to talk. Mm. You know, but they've never really been given um, the platform to talk. Yeah, uh, they've never made, been made to feel comfortable to talk, but once you give them that platform, men just don't shut up. And yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> no, no I don't. <laughs> the, important, the important thing is is to listen without judgment, and that's where I think we've failed massively. Is we all seem to want to have the answer for that person, but the important thing is to listen without judgment and let them speak. Let them have that platform. Yeah. It may well be something that may seem silly to me, but it's massive to them. You know what yeah. I mean? It's, it's not my job to say that's silly. And I See, think if we give the people more platforms and the more men that get up on stage and speak about it, yeah. then we start conditioning them in the right way then to be able to speak. I see, I see, I think this is the, the important crutch. And somebody at an event I was speaking at earlier asked me to define the importance of lived experience. And I see lived experience as the vehicle that takes people from the problem or the companies to the, to, to the problem to the solution without being the solution. Yeah. So that's the engagement piece. Um, and not exclusively to men, but especially with men. I get brought in, like you do, I guess, to increase engagement in the stuff they've got going on already. We're not replacing medical advice. We're not re replacing the well-being initiatives or the classroom stuff. We're basically just getting people in the door. I mean, and yeah. a great example, I was doing some work with a, like a, a trade person company, 92% male, 92% uh, trade people. Um, they were running a well-being initiative and the usual response was 30 people that would come into head office to do this well-being course. I did a hand-to-face video saying, oh, hey chaps, I'm going to be there. Uh, we're going to talk about this. It's not going to be as heavy as promised. I'll, I'll treat it like a really casual kind of thing, hand-to-face. Always remember this. I've done it at Paddington when I was traveling. And based on the fact that they put that video out internally, not by email, not by newsletter or anything like that, they have 500 people sign up. All male. And I think that's the difference. The, the difference is the engagement uh, piece is the lived experience part. And I think sometimes that's the bit that companies can be a little hesitant to engage because it's real and it's raw. And I mean, I've heard your full story and it's a shame we haven't got along to go into that today. But I've heard your full story and it's powerful and it gives you goosebumps and it makes you horrified in some places. 
Um, but because you have you share that, as you said, the vulnerability becomes a superpower. You become bulletproof because actually no one's got anything on you. It's just all out there for everyone to see. Um, yeah. So the other thing you mentioned, which is really interesting right now, so just for people that are watching this on kind of catch up um, or listening on catch up, this has been recorded during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, we are all currently in lockdown, certain phase of lockdown. Um, my experience is, mate, that a lot of people that have had mental health challenges are actually coping a lot better than people that haven't. And I think, and you touched on it just now, I think it's because they've got the mechanisms in place to manage their state. What have you found in that experience, mate? To be honest, on a personal level, I've loved the lockdown um, because I see around me everything slowing down. Um, and this is what I've been trying to achieve for years and years and years is getting people to slow down and reflect, you know, and people are now being forced to do that. You know, people yeah. are being furloughed and so therefore they can't do any work. So all they've got is themselves yeah. and their space around them. And I'm seeing so much now where people are reconnecting with the families. You know, they realize that mm. they've got a wife or they've got a husband or, you know, they've got kids. I was mm. speaking to my son's deputy head teacher, second head teacher, and he said, said you know what? I said, part of me doesn't want to go back. He said, I've just realized that I've got a nine month old daughter. Yeah. You know, and for the first six months, I never saw her. You know, and now I'm playing with her every single day and it's beautiful. You know, if we can just take some of that and keep it going after this because we live in a fickle world and we forget very easily. You know, we forget very easily. So when it goes back to whatever the new normal is and it gets some level of normality, I just hope that people don't forget that yeah. they're reconnected with the family, they're reconnected with nature, they're reconnected with the outdoors and they're reconnected with the real reason why they're here. You know I think I mean? you're right. I think it's, it's very true to say the, the world has, has changed forever. And it, that doesn't sound is was well, not meant with the doomsday kind of approach. It is saying is that the world has changed forever. It's a case of, like you said, people have underestimated the value of friendships, freedoms, um, being able to come and go as you please, um, all of those kind of things. So I think definitely, I hope it's not treated as a moment in time, and I, and I don't it think is it encouraging. Will be. I don't no, think I hope it will not. Be. And I think it is encouraging people to think differently. But this is both personally and professionally, because let's not forget, we're, we're, we're in business as well. We're both mm. self-employed people. But we've had to, to pivot and do all those kind of exciting new words that we've discovered all the, over the past six weeks to make sure that we, we stay, we survive. And, and based on who I'm speaking to at the time, they're either in acknowledgement mode, where actually they haven't, they've refused to accept that this is brutal. There's no other way of looking at it. Or... They're in survival mode. Can we survive through this in every sense? And then finally, can we evolve? And I think the, the evolution part is the exciting part. Um, yeah. And we have to do things differently, um, potentially for a very long time. To the extent, as I said, from a business perspective, this could change things for years, given what well, we I, do. I have a strange thought process because I always say to myself every morning, oh, wow, the world's caught up to me. You know, I lived in a tent for a year in the Lake District and I lived off the land for most of it. Um, a farmer in the Lake District showed me how to catch rabbits and squirrels and various other berries and what you could eat, leaves and stuff like that. And it was the most spiritual awakening. And one thing that I really found out during that time is just how insignificant we are in the grand scheme of things. When you're looking up out of the sky and there's no light pollution, you're seeing the star displays and just incredible from so many millions of miles away, you realize all we can do is impact on our immediate surroundings. That's yeah. all we can do. And so I always talk about when you're going in a car and you come to the junction, if you let somebody go and you wave at them and smile, if you was to follow that car, you guarantee that that car will then let the next person out and the next person. And before you know it, in that 24 hour period, you probably impacted positively on about 90, 100 people. Okay. Yeah, all you know about is the one or two people that you followed in a minute. And yeah. One another thing that I realized was, just like the seasons, life comes in cycles. Guarantee, if you look back in history, every four years, five years, there's a massive plane crash, there's a massive national disaster, there's a pandemic of some sort, whether it's SARS or swine flu or whatever. There's always something, you know, there's corruption from politicians. It's a cycle every four or five years. I guarantee if you look back at history, something big like this happens. Maybe not as yeah. big as this, but something happens. So the only thing that we've got control of is our mindset and our own selves. 
You know what I mean? And the Absolutely. more we live in our true identity, the easier things are come because all those things are going to happen anyway, whether we like it or not. Yeah. So if we can get ourselves resilient and living in our true identity now, no matter what throws at us, life will be so much more calmer. Powerful stuff. Good work, my friend. And what does lockdown look like for you? What's been going on? Uh, World War Three with the kids. Um, <laughs> you know, I've been through every single country in the UN trying to be a diplomat with the kids at the moment. It's, uh, it's, it's all fun and games. Um, I don't know. I'm not stressed. I'm not. You know, I am in moments where I am reflecting. What I mean, I let it pass. You know what I mean? I yeah. don't. I don't force it. Um, but I, even queuing for the, the local shop and what have you, it's just giving you that time to just pull back and <laughs> relax. You know what I mean? It's, I, I'm laughing because of the story we were chatting about before we came on. So I think actually you owe the people tuning into this the story about your T-shirt and the supermarket. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, <laughs> one of my big passions is New York. I love New York and it just feels like home to me. Um, and there's a bar within New York called Rudy's and it's quite a special bar. It's a dive bar. Um, but it was the first bar to get the liquor license straight after prohibition. And it's one of the oldest bars in New York. Um, but they've got a mascot outside called Barry Von Swine, which is a huge pig, massive fiberglass pig. And they've got this t-shirt collection and they've got a coronavirus collection now. And I bought one the other week and it came a couple of days back with the pig in a mask pointing saying back away on the back of it and stay away on the front with his face. And so I was in Alder the other day and I had this and I could hear people chattering away and talking to me and what have you. But then out of nowhere, one of the workers came up, patted me on the back, put his arm on me and said, oh, fantastic t-shirt, mate. Brilliant t-shirt. Where would you get that from? And I'm thinking, this is a real <laughs> simple message. <laughs> back away. You know? <laughs> we can't get it more simpler than this, you know? <laughs> And so, yeah, I'd, I'd have to tell him politely, you know, that, you know, please admire it from two meters away. <laughs> there, there's, some, there's some strange folk out there right now. I was, at I least was, he was happy. You know, he may have killed me happy, off, yeah. but at least he was happy. <laughs> but I, was, I was watching an article, well, so I'm watching something on telly yesterday, a news article. Um, it was saying about an uh, American uh, lady was wearing a, a mask, uh, but she cut a hole. She said it's really difficult <laughs> to breathe through it. <laughs> There's so many examples of that, though. You know, in the, our local court, my wife had a bit of a to be with the manager because she was trying to reach for a power of chocolate. And that's priority and that's essential shopping for women in, you know, in lockdown. And uh, the manager had the right go at her, saying, you know, I've got kids at home, I've got this and what have you, you know, don't get too close. And she was social distancing. She wasn't that far, you know, she was far away, another way. But he had a mask, which was under his chin. Yeah. <laughs> you've lost the argument immediately <laughs> lost the argument you know what I mean? put your mask up and then argue the fact that you're a bit too close so my, my, fav- my favourite author is a guy called Terry Pratchett R.I.P uh, so he um, he wrote a series of book called a Discworld series for those who know it know it um, and he, the, one of his infamous quotes was we live in interesting times it's exactly where we are right now so a lot of people doing some weird stuff from that position of fear that we've been chatting about. Um, Everybody's got a story. Everybody's got a story. Well, the, the everyone's got a story. Is, you to judge. Everyone's, let's face it, everyone's creating a new reality. Everyone's winging it because we're playing by new rules. So um, you can forgive some people some faux pas, maybe. Maybe. Maybe not the face mask with a hole in it. There we go. Uh, <laughs> it's interesting, though. You, you, you talk about that because I put an advert on uh, social media a few weeks back and I got attacked by a particular person saying I was a parasite and I should be doing it for free in the current climate, blah, blah, blah. And it was interesting because the person that I did, you know, who called me a parasite and said that I should be doing it for free, for about 18 months, we dedicated the vast majority of our profits. We used to have an events company, so we had pantomimes and tribute nights and various other things. We dedicated pretty much most of our profits to his seven-year-old daughter who had leukemia. And we yeah. actually sponsored a room in Ronald McDonald House in her name. Yeah. You know, yet he was calling me a parasite for charging a significantly reduced rate for one-to-one stuff. You know, now, I could have got really bitter and twisted and angry about that. But you know what? He's got his own struggles. He's got his own issues that he's not been able to resolve at the moment. And so, therefore, he's not acting 
in the normal yeah. sense of the way, you know. So just yeah, yeah. it off. is true. I get that. Actually, true. But it's an interesting one because I kind of, especially in the space that we're in, um, and I had this conversation with somebody on the, on the last episode that um, you kind of you don't want to be seen as ambulance chasing. So, yeah. but also with that in mind. Um, I, I've given away a lot more in terms of video content and lots of stuff during lockdown. Yeah. A load more than I would usually book. A little bit more time, if I'm honest. Um, but also you want to help people as much as you can. But we also have a responsibility to not only ourselves, but to the economy to make sure that we keep things ticking over as well as possible. Um, yeah. So we, we do need to have more compassion right now and understanding. Um, we do need to go easy. I did a two minute topics video for my YouTube series yesterday on just that. Go easy, go easy on yourself, go easy on them. Cause like I said, everyone's in, in various states of dread and anxiety right now. I get that. We don't know what the end date is. We don't know what the end date's going to look like, or what even's going to look like afterwards. So um, yeah, absolutely get that. So most important uh, question of the, the whole interview is this. <laughs> I'm just about to announce you on stage at the O2 arena. You've got 20,000 yeah. people that's come to see you. Uh, I'm just about to give you the big welcome the heft of a stage. What walk on music do you have? What music do you come on to? Always will be um, Walk a Mile in My Shoes by Elvis Presley. The King. Walk a Mile in My Shoes by Elvis Presley. Look it up, yeah. folks. That's that's the tune for the man. That's the tune for the heft. The words so, are magical. I'm not sure. I genuinely, I've not heard it. I would. I definitely will be checking it out. I think my dog might have heard it because she's really piping up just now. <laughs> Again, refuse to edit, refuse to edit. It's going to be a theme. <laughs> anyway, Dave, big thank you for coming on. I really do appreciate your time. Uh, honestly, you're one of life's good guys, and it's good to see how well you're doing. Um, so, big thanks to Dave. Round of applause to Dave. You're a good man. Thank you for coming on here. And, guys, thank you for tuning in to the Forge Ahead Show, whether that be for the video, whether that be for the podcast. We're just delighted to have you here. Please tune in to Dougie Stone Radio. They're freaking global. Our sponsors here. And we'll be back next week with another amazing guest for you who have gone from adversity to excitement and to tell us that bit in between. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.